Well, good morning, Tabernacle. It's kind of weird after that intro video. It's poignant. It's kind of in-depth. It's like, huh. And then it's like, hey, how you doing? It's kind of a gear shift, whatever. Uh, welcome to the Tabernacle. Uh, we're honored that you're here. Uh, some of you we know are just trying us out for the first time or just the last couple weeks. We'll try our best not to disappoint. But uh, if you have a Bible, and I hope you do have one, or if you have a device, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians, as we've been saying. Uh, that's 1 Corinthians. It was, those have been around the Christian ghetto for more than a minute. But uh, um, this series that we've, or that we've just started is going to take about the next uh, 30, 32 weeks or so. And so that's the MO of our church. Uh, I, we normally just don't get up and just share, this is what's on my heart, this is what I think you need to know, and instead we just let God do the talking. Because sometimes God says some things that are hard to understand, and for our culture, sometimes it's like, wait, what? Do you agree? Some of you do? Okay, well, maybe you're better than, all right. I'm still trying to get my life in line with this book. But we do believe that this is God's word. And as we go into this study, uh, this study of Corinthians, that um, uh, we, we, we gave you the warning that not everything in the Bible is easy to understand, nor does it fit with what we think our cultural norm is. But we need to remind ourselves that the reason we preach and teach from the Bible is that we don't get to recreate God in our image. We're created in his image, but we're sinful and we're fallen. And so this process that we're in together is to see God transform us into his image, right? So, so even this week, uh, I, I felt like I should post something and, and, and it was a scripture verse and this is God's stance on uh, a fill in the blank. And I'm not trying to start any fights, um, but you know, most of the comments were like, yeah, right on. And then some are like, well, I'm not sure. And uh, so the job of the pastor is to say, I hide behind this, right? Which isn't to say I'm using this as a weapon. It's just, or it's more like I'm saying, yeah, he said it. I don't know, take it up with him, right, type of deal. In fact, I got an email from someone that was deeply distressed. They're not a part of our church, but they were distressed that that might hurt someone's feelings. And, and so I, so I uh, uh, and it was, it was a very heartfelt, important thing to say. And my response, I tried to be as just as heartfelt and compassionate is say, I hurt for people who are struggling too. But it doesn't change who God is. It doesn't change who God is. And it's only in the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ that we can begin to deal with the pain and the struggle we have with our lives not matching up with a holy God. And so I'm, I mean that in earnest that we stand behind what Scripture says. And, and just a couple more things before we jump in uh, to this part of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is where we'll be. Um, if you missed last week's message... Uh, which I did, but watched online, I highly commend that to you. Pastor Ben did an unbelievable job, a fantastic job of introducing the series and giving us a lot of background for why this letter was written. And you can find that on our website or the app or YouTube, Vimeo, all the different places that it's on. And uh, Pastor Ben's a for real preacher. I don't know if you noticed that. He's a for real preacher. So uh, we're in good hands there. But uh, um, this letter... Uh, was written by the Apostle Paul to a church in a Greek city called Corinth. That's why it's called Corinthians. And it's preserved by God's Holy Spirit. He was inspired by God's Holy Spirit. And so this letter is also for churches in northern Michigan and all around the world. So all the way back then and today. So you'll hear me say Paul writes, but it's really God speaking not that Paul is God, but carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's what we believe. He's speaking to us. And it's timeless. And the occasion for writing this was that, remember, Paul was an apostle. And as we've said, everywhere he went, and you can read all about it in the book of Acts, he either started a riot or a revival. And where there was a revival, where there were people that came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, a church would be planted. And then Paul would say, okay, you guys got this? And he would move on. And the whole story of Acts is Paul going back and sometimes revisiting these churches and pumping them up again and making sure that they were growing healthy and strong. Well, in Corinth, there was a prominent family. We believe she was also a prominent businesswoman of some kind, an earnest believer in Jesus. Her name was Chloe. And Chloe had some members of her household on business where Paul was. And so she sent a message to Paul saying, Paul, we got problems in Corinth. 
And it wasn't gossip. She was going to the founder of the church, uh, the one that had planted the church, and saying, we're getting off track. And, and there was a detailed report. And so Paul's letter to the Corinthians deals with all of these issues. So it's God's letter to his church, both then and now. And so that's the backdrop as we jump in, and I'll start in verse 10 of chapter 1, and we'll read to about 17, and then we'll kind of tease out some thoughts here. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. <laughs> give, give Paul a break. He's getting older. <laughs> For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And this is God's word, and this is God's word for us. And the title of the message is also the theme of this section. It's for us, one church, multiple locations, one church among other Christian churches. He says, be united. Be united. Now I'm going to tell you, when you get people of different genders different backgrounds, different family of origin, supporting different sports teams, <laughs> different truck preferences, different ways of framing a house, different style, different dress, banjo thumping country rednecks, emo rock and roll kids, and the alt crowd that doesn't listen to anything on Spotify <laughs> because it's mainstream. When you get all these people together, how can you be united? In the same way, at a work, you know, at your work, at your school, on a team, at your job, in a marriage or a family. But unity is important to God. Unity is so important that I could have just come up with all the scriptures in the Old Testament and the New Testament about unity and just stood here very, you know, just kind of bored. Well, maybe I am boring, but just kind of just read it all. I'm just going to read it all and then say, there, mic drop, walk away. <laughs> Unity is important. He's saying, be united. And apparently this church is not like us. <laughs> so it'll never happen here, but just in case, let's jump in. So he begins by reminding them they're the same family. I appeal to you, brothers. And it's interesting that he starts there. We don't like to think of ourselves as the same family because many of us don't even like our own families, let alone the church family. And he says, I appeal to you, brothers, sisters. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and he, so he says, I appeal to you, brothers. And we sing songs that say, I am a child of God. Well, did you know you're not the only child? And, and essentially, I wonder if sometimes God is, you know, it's a big road trip. We're trying to get to the end. We're trying to get to heaven. He's like, don't make me stop this car and come back there. But that's what he's saying. Hey, you're brothers. Nothing's thicker than blood. Brothers, sisters, I appeal to you. And he says, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's significant that he calls upon the name. It's by the name. It's in the name. It's because of the name. There's power in the name. The name of Jesus, not the name of the tabernacle, not the name of Paul, not the name of John, not the name of your favorite TV preacher, not the name of your favorite author, your favorite music style, you know. It's in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the basis for the appeal. He's saying this is serious. This is serious. 
And it should be the same for us. But then he says some hard things. He says that all of you agree. There's very few things that we can agree on, it seems. Now, we can all agree that the Lions will never make a Super Bowl. (laughs) But maybe not. I just caused offense to some people, right? We can't even agree on Michigan versus Michigan State, right? We all know that God's team is Notre Dame. (laughs) It's named for his mother. But he says that you all agree that there's no divisions among you. Am I the only one that sees that the church can divide about anything and everything? We talked about that a few weeks ago. Some of you right now, you're feeling divided because here in Buckley, we're freezing. I like it because I'm up here working, right? So I like it cold and it keeps you awake. And I'm sorry, Manistee, I was texted this morning, your AC is out. I'm sorry about that. Well, you're united in your suffering. (laughs) But there's divisions. I don't want division between Buckley and Manistee. We're just waiting for somebody to fix the AC right over there. But he says that that you all agree there's no divisions And then he says, be united in the same mind and the same judgment. How do we do that and what does that mean? Well, I I did a little digging into like the original languages. I won't bore you with all this. But essentially what he's saying is I want you, church, to speak with the same voice. Speak the same is what he's saying. Now, what God is saying, what Paul is saying is not that we become some sort of lockstep uniform, no diversity type of outfit. That is called a cult. That's what cults demand. And there's something in human beings that longs for unity and longs for simplicity and longs for harmony. Legitimately, it's why some people will choose to never marry because they prefer, I got my thing, I got my life, I don't want, you know, I don't want anybody else to fight about how the toilet paper comes over the top or under, like a Christian does. I don't want to squeeze toothpaste from the middle of the bottom. So they, so they don't want that kind of diversity, and so they just... But there's a longing in the human heart for that type of unity. That's why people do choose the cults. And, and even in 2022, you, you, know, you hear about people that will sign over their lives and they'll take on a new way of dress and they'll shave their head and they'll join the commune or the compound and they'll surrender, you know, the leader, their pin number to all of their bank accounts, which is not a bad idea. But you say, why do people do that? I'm joking. I don't want to your pin number. But why do people do that is because there's a longing for that unity. But unity is not uniformity. You can have unity with diversity. And so when he says to speak the same, the best examples I can think of what he's saying is, look, we gather for worship, but when we scatter, let's have the same words doctrinally speaking. That's a fancy word for we believe in all the same big rocks. That there's one God who eternally exists in three persons. That man is separated from him because of our sin. That all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. And the only way to put it back together is God who sent Jesus on a mission to come to earth, to die on a cross, to be a sacrifice for my sin. That if I believe that by faith, I receive God's grace. And there's nothing else that will save me but Jesus and his name and his sacrifice. Nothing else. And I don't perform in order to get that. What I do is I respond to his love, I respond to his grace by living life differently, trying to conform to him instead of demanding he conform to me. And that because of his burial, resurrection, and ascension, I can be victorious and have real life. These are big rocks. Because I believe that, I get baptized into his name. Because I believe that, I join a local body of other people that are not like me, but that are also children of God in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what speaking the same means. We're going to have differences in here, and we have had differences in here. But unity is above that. He's reminding us of what's most important. So uh, just a couple examples. Uh, uh, This church is governed by a board of directors, not a board of elders, a board of directors. We have both men and women on that board, and they keep the church accountable financially, legally, to our statement of faith, and, and they keep me accountable. A church where the pastor has no accountability is not a good situation. Pastors need accountability. Is there an amen in the house? Well, I got plenty of it, and you're not it. (laughs) 
But you got to have accountability. You got to have accountability, right? Now, when that board comes together, we don't always agree. And there's discussions, and there's different ideas, and there's different plans, there's different genders in the room, there's different backgrounds, there's all sorts of different things. But then we come to an agreement on the direction, whether the vote is unanimous or not. When we leave the boardroom, we speak with one voice. That's good leadership. What bad leadership is, we make a decision, and it was kind of a split decision, and then you have one group, well, I didn't vote for that, well, I disagreed with that, well, I'm out of here, and that's bad leadership. Good leadership says, this is one voice, this is the, the, the majority, and this is what we've decided. That was for free, for whatever organization you're a part of. You see this work out in a family, right? A kid comes to mom, hey, can I eat a third piece of pie? And there's only one left. And she says, no, you save that for your dad, like a good Christian. <laughs> and, um, and then the kid goes to dad, hey, dad, do you care if I have another piece of pie? And he's watching him, sure, do whatever you want. There's going to be ruckus, right? When dad finds out or mom says, why did you go to dad? This happens all the time. Children know how to play mom against dad or dad against mom. That's why, and this is for free, if you're a dad and the kid comes to you and says, can I da-da-da-da-da, and you go, what did your mom say? That is a good answer. <laughs> that is a great answer. That's not him being lazy. That's him saying, I want to be of one voice with her because parents got to be united against the kids. <laughs> it's the same thing because they are assassins. They're ass <laughs> well, you know it's true. Go behind closed door. What are we going to do? What are we do? One voice. One. It's the same thing. But he's talking about doctrine. He's talking about doctrine. He knows they're going to have differences, that you speak the same. But what we love to do is we love to split into factions. Now, the occasion for the factions in Corinth were the, the example that he used. He says, apparently, some of you say, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Now, we can speculate about what those divisions were about based on what we know about those historical figures. Remember, Paul was the church planner. He had one message, Christ and him crucified, the message of the cross, the gospel, get him dunked, moving on. That was his thing. It was the same message all the time. The founda That's why we have Galatians. That's why we have Romans. That's why we have just the foundation. This is what it is, and now let's go. Well, when he moved on from Corinth, there was another guy that came in. You know, Paul's this fire and brimstone guy, the one-trick pony, right? He very much in my mind reminds me of my wife's grandfather, who was one of the founders of this church. He was never the pastor of this church, but he preached an old-timey camp meeting in a tent, right, right here in Buckley, that launched a church. And, and he, was one of the, he was a preacher. That's what he did. I've told you before. When he got worked up, he's the type of guy, pull out his false teeth, set it on the pulpit, then he was really getting after it. And then right before the benediction, you slip him back in, and then you get nice again. That was, that was Paul. That's their team. And, oh, we just love that. Yell at us some more. And some of us are like that. The more I yell, you're like, oh, give it to me. Like, you're like fish in a barrel. You don't feel like you've been to church unless I've yelled at you, right? Well, then came a pastor named Apollos. Now, Apollos was a Greek. Paul was a Jewish guy of Roman citizenship. Well, that represented something there. He was a Roman citizen. He was an outsider. Then the guy that became their pastor was a guy named Apollos. He'd been to Harvard. He was very polished, very intelligent, used a lot of big words, you know, and he was great at teaching. Now, Paul's not against Apollos, and Apollos isn't against Paul. They both preach the same gospel. But that's where the team started. This guy's so much better. He's way more like us. He likes the things that we do. He, he's intelligent. Man, we could put him out on the streets of Corinth, and he's not like, you know, uh, don't associate with him. We like Apollos. He's more of a teacher. We go in more in depth. He gives us real meat. That doesn't sound like 2022 at all, does it? Yeah, it does. We love teams. And then there was the Cephas team. Cephas is another name for Peter. This is the apostle, right? The one that Jesus kind of put in charge of all the apostles, the oldest one. And, and, and Peter, what we know from the book of Acts and from Galatians, Peter sometimes struggled to leave his Jewishness behind within the new covenant. 
Not that there's anything wrong with being a Jew, but now he's a follower of Jesus. And so all of the Old Testament you know, dietary restrictions and customs and festivals and so forth, he knew about the sacrifice. He didn't have to do sacrifices anymore. But some of those other things he hung on to, like kosher foods, can I eat bacon, can I not eat bacon? What a horrible decision to ever have to make, right? And we know that sometimes Paul, if he was with his Jewish friends, he would be all kosher. But then when he was with Gentile friends, he would go ahead and, and change his dietary restrictions. In fact, Paul and Peter had a, had a public argument about it, and Paul won because we're not under the old law. We're under the new law. And I believe Peter just humbly submitted to that, and he said, oh, yeah, you got me. You were right. But there was a group that loved to hang on to like the, oh, the old fundamentalism, you know, hang on to the checklist that makes me feel religious and spiritual. We don't have that at all today, do we? Yes, we do. Why do they dress that way? Why do they listen to that music? Can you believe their kids go to public school? Can you believe that they ate that? They watch that movie or so forth and so on. So they're a team. You see, it's just like us. Even this last team, which is kind of an interesting team, it says, well, I follow Christ. Well, what team is that? Well, that's the one that tries to stay above it all. I don't need you people. I don't need church. I don't need all these leaders. I don't need membership. It's just me and Jesus. And usually that person is kind of the, kind of the hyper-spiritual person that really doesn't want to submit to anything. They just want to have their kind of little thing. You know, I've, I've said before that uh, we see four different types of people in the church. We have knowers, beers, doers, and feelers. And even though we're all knowers, beers, doers, and feelers, there's one that we kind of get attracted to. The knowers, they were attracted to Apollo. He's an intelligent Greek. The beers, they were attracted to Cephas. Well, holiness matters. Well, of course it does. The doers, they were with Paul, supporting his ministry. They were traveling with him. I don't have time for all this. We've got to plan another church and go on another mission trip and so forth. And then the feelers, right? They're the ones, do we really have to have a preacher? Can we just have a three-hour singling fest? Just more singing, you know, nothing wrong with singing. And the point is, who's right and who's wrong? Well, we need them all is my point. But we divide the same way into these factions. And what happens is the different leaders of these factions or the things themselves, they become a surrogate savior. What happens is when I take my eyes off Jesus and I start looking at the thing instead, I start looking for validation and meaning and purpose in the thing, and I want to get as many people around me because if they're into it too, I feel better about myself. Oh, it's insidious. And it's not just around leaders or styles. You can get super fired up about a ministry or a ministry program or a book or a worship style. And then all of a sudden, you become a fierce evangelist for that style. And, and you say you're about Jesus, but you're not really focused on Jesus. You're focused on the thing that brought you meaning and purpose. It's self-validation. Do you see how that works? And it's not just about ministries. I mean, I've, I've seen that happen when someone goes on a mission trip. I went overseas on a mission trip. I can't believe everyone in our church has not been on a mission Everyone in the church, even the children, should go. Well, maybe not everyone's called to go and do but then we become a fierce evangelist for that thing. And then we only hang out with that team and that faction and then these little cracks in our unity pop up. It can happen over uh, gluten. Or gluten-free, I'm sorry. It can have an over diet. I mean, there's people that want to bring you, this is God's way to parent. And anyone who doesn't do God's way to parent, I don't even know what's wrong with you. And you have your little God's way to parent team. Or God's way to do marriage, or God's way about money. Now, God has things to say about all those things, but if it, they're dividing us by the latest and greatest trend, fashion, book, what have you, that's not unity. That's not unity. They're factions, and he says they're surrogate saviors. And so it's important for us to understand that your surrogate savior can't save you. Your surrogate savior can't save you. 
The greatest danger in standing here and preaching and standing here and preaching where God has blessed our church for, for, for the last, you know, night, I mean, it was forever, but I'm saying specifically in this slow burn revival for the last 19 years, I don't want people attached to my personality. I can't save you. I'm just a dude and my wife's first in line to give you the proof. I can't. Your campus pastor can't save you. Student pastor can't save you. Your favorite online teacher can't save you. The ministry that you're a part of can't save you. The thing that you're the fierce evangelist for cannot save you because they're all surrogate savior. Only Jesus validates your identity. You want to feel good about yourself? Read Ephesians chapter 1 again. Get your identity in him. I'm a child of God. I'm saved. I'm adopted. I'm forgiven. Grace is lavished on me. I have a purpose. He has a plan. Whether I'm suffering or things are good, it doesn't matter. He has a purpose and a plan. I'm a child of God, but I'm not the only child. And when I fix my eyes there and I focus on the vertical relationship, then there's a foundation for the horizontal And for me, it's no mistake that that's in the shape, if you can imagine it, of a cross. If the vertical relationship between you and God has lost focus or perspective or is not there, you have nothing to nail the cross beam on. And that's going to fracture and you're going to divide. And yeah, we're going to come in here and we're going to be different about a lot of things. But your surrogate savior doesn't give you purpose and meaning. I'm going to go there because it's my job. Your favorite political party program candidate cannot save you. And we have fierce evangelists in our church on both sides of the aisle that thankfully are ticked off at me because I refuse to surrender this to politics. I refuse. I refuse. I'm reminded of Joshua standing before the walls of Jericho when he was scouting it out, God's man leading God's people on God's mission to conquer the promised land. Remember, those of you that were here, and he was confronted by the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ, and he said, are you for us or against us? And he had a flaming sword, and God answers, no. I don't participate in your multiple choice. But I do command the armies of the Lord, now take off your sandals, this is holy ground, and I'll tell you what you must do. I'm not saying politics aren't important. They are. I think we need Christians in politics. I I believe Christians should be informed, and Christians should take their faith into the ballot box, not their feelings or their emotions. But we're not going to let those become our surrogate saviors. We cannot. And if that makes you mad... Good. What he said. That's what he said. He gives me my identity, and if I fix the vertical, then the horizontal becomes easier. Over in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, we get some clues on the how to do that. In Ephesians 4, God says to us, and this is Paul writing, he says, I therefore... A prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. What's your calling? To be a child of God. To be saved, adopted, new, a new creation. Within this body, with all humility, gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Now, that's going to be tough because all of us struggle with humility. That's why we try to self-validate. i got to join a team and get other people to join my team so I can feel good about me. Trying to make an identity. Instead of relying on what Christ has said, I need to recreate it myself. And so when it says, with all humility, that doesn't mean thinking less of myself. It means thinking of myself less. And it's about What blesses you? What honors you? What's inclusive of others? That's why at the tabernacle, we've tried to be a church that is inclusive. Now, there's big rocks that we will stand on, and we're not going to recreate them to make culture feel better about itself, but we're going to agree on those big rocks and speak with one voice. That takes humility to say that I'm not God. He's God, and I know, right? Some of these things are hurtful, and some of my friends feel rejected, but 
I can't change what God says. I'm still trying to conform my life to it. That takes humility. It takes humility to share the same space with other people, different styles, different, even the way we dress. He says, so he says humility. Then he gets to gentleness. Oh, that's a struggle for most people in northern Michigan. This is true. My wife and I moved here almost 20 years ago from Charlotte, North Carolina. The land of sunshine, slower pace, sweet tea, a little bit of a twang. They talk slower. It's because they had grits for breakfast, you know. <laughs> they're all gone, a little gummy in there, you know. And then they're just like, hey, how you doing, ma'am, sir? You know, everyone's Mr., Miss, ma'am, sir. You call a guy sir around here, what do you mean? I work for a living, you know. But down there, it's like, oh, soft and whatever. And, you know, they open the door after you. No, after you. No, no one goes in stores. They just stand at the door and go, after you, after you. No, after you, I insist. It's all that twangy southern charm. And then you come up north, and they're like, Move, get out of the way. I got to go. I don't have time to talk. What's what? Very direct. And for two years, I thought, man, these people are mean. They're not gentle. In our own church parking lot, I'm pulling out. I get cut off three times. I got to go, right? I figured it out, though. It's not our nature. It's just that it's cold. And if we stop to talk, you might get frostbite. You got to keep moving. But it's struggle. I mean, there's a struggle to be gentle to see people, to hear people, to say, you know what? My perspective is not the only perspective that takes humility. It takes gentleness and patience. Oh, why patience? I'm not patient. And praying for patience, as we've said, that's the worst. Because if you pray for patience, it's going to be a rough week. (laughs) Because you can, the only way to learn patience is to be patient, to be patient. And then this word, he says, bearing with one another, bearing with one another. I think that word was chosen on purpose because the implication of bearing with someone is that you're helping them carry something. There's a task, and sometimes it's a chore. Sometimes it's a burden. Sometimes it's a big, heavy backpack. That's what unity looks like. You know, not everyone's growing at the same pace that you are. And someone that's new to faith may be all the things that God wants from them and how he wants to conform them to his image aren't as, ad- as advanced as you, and so they don't understand how they're being influenced by the culture. Well, can we let God be the lead discipler and let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit? And instead of fighting about it on social media, can you just bear with them a little bit? And as an aside, can we stop putting everything we feel on social media? Get a therapist, man. Or join a small group, <laughs> or, or get a friend, <laughs> you know? He says, bear with one another. And then he says, eager to maintain unity. What he's saying is to live a life worthy of the calling in us should be an eagerness, despite how I feel, to be unified with a local body. You see, unity is more important than my feelings. Unity is more important than my feelings. So much of everything we do is guided by feelings. Now, I know that there's legitimate reasons to leave a body, a a, a local body, and choose to be a part of another local body. But if it's just because you don't, I just feel that we're, feelings are important, but I also want to know what you think. And I also want to know that you believe. And I also want to know, can you leave that place and still speak kindly about that place? Because if you can't, you might need to stay and work some relationships out before you just ditch them. Because we're a culture that is slaves to our feelings because we're told, just do what you feel. If I did everything I... Well, let's not even go there. (laughs) Unity is more important than my feelings. Jesus, in his his, uh, 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 teaching to his disciples after after the Last Supper... Before he went to the cross, he said, a new command I give you, that you love one another. That you love one another. That you're to love one another the way the Father has loved me and I have loved you. I've shown you that love, now give it to one another. That's the vertical, understanding God's love for me so that now I can give it to others. That's why some of us, when, you know, there's that one song about God's love for me and we're just wrecked and you see somebody with their hands up in the air and then there's five other people that are like, why are they putting their hands on the air? They want me to look at them. And it's like, get over yourself. They're overcome with the fact that God's love is for them. 
And they're saying, that is for me. That's what I'm clinging to. When we understand that, and again, not that everyone's got to put up their hands in the air like they just don't care. Just be cool for a minute, right? Let them do their thing. But God's love for me, when I understand that, then I can give that love to others. And that's part of unity. He prayed that we would love one another. He taught us to love one another. And I came across this. When, when I understand God's love for me, it helps me love others more and need them less. Think about that. What do I mean by need them? I'm not talking about isolating. I'm not talking about be a drive through Christian that comes to church and doesn't want to know anybody because it'll get too difficult. No, God's love for me helps me love others more the way Christ did, unconditionally, sacrificially, the way it says in Philippians chapter 4 that we should love one another selflessly, thinking of others' needs first instead of my needs first and my preferences. And so when I understand God's love for me more, I can love others more, but need their validation less. I don't need to join a team. I'm on God's team. What other team do I want to be on? I got that team. I don't need to join your faction. I don't need to sign your petition. I'm not talking about petitions out there. I'm talking about like your little church petition. There are no church petitions. You have a church petition, we tear them up. What, are we a democracy? <laughs> no, we're a monarchy. Oh, that's revelation. We're a monarchy here. Who's the king? Well, you tell me. And so God's love for me helps me love others more and need their validation less. I don't need to feel good because he's already made me feel good. And then lastly, there's a little three-letter word in verse 10. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree. All. This isn't for them. This isn't for those people. It isn't for that team that tried to get you on the team and then you joined another team. It isn't for the people that you avoid that go to that service, you come to this service. No, it's for all, no exceptions. That we speak with one voice about who God is. We're going to have differences about politics. We're going to have differences about issues. We're going to have differences about preferences and temperatures and worship styles and who's your favorite preacher and what's your favorite song and all those different types of things. When you come together to gather for worship in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we scatter and speak with one voice. That's who we're going to be. That's where we're going to be. And there's unity in that diversity. But he says it's all. That means that unity starts with me. Unity starts with me. If you're trying to have more unity with your spouse and you're waiting for him or her to come over to your side, unity starts with you, bro. You want to have unity with people within your church you vehemently disagree with, you can argue with them in the comments section ad nauseum. Or you can say, you know what? Unity starts with me, and I'm going to bear with my brother right now. I'm going to bear with my... If there's an offense, I'm going to do Matthew 18. I'm going to go to my brother, and we're going to work it out. And if they don't listen, I'm going to take another, all that stuff that we did in the Blood, Sweat, and Tears series. But unity starts with me. Only three things you can't control in this world. People, places, and things. (laughs) But you can control you. Your mouth, your heart, your attitude, your focus. And it doesn't mean I just focus on Jesus. I don't need these people. No, we need both parts of the cross. Love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love my neighbor as ourselves. And Jesus prayed that we would love one another the way he loved us. So I'm going to invite the bands, both in Manistee and here in Buckley, if they'd make their way out. They're, they're going to close us in a song. And as they're coming, I want to remind you of one more thing. Don't miss this, that Jesus prayed for. After he said, I want you to love one another, in John chapter 17, he prayed this to his father. Father, I pray that they would be one. Would you just say that word, both here, Manistee, wherever you are at home, just say one. 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 
He said, I pray that they would be one. As you and I are one, may they be one with us and one with one another. He knew unity would be a struggle. Paul leads off with it, and he's going to get in a bunch of other issues in Corinthians, a bunch of other stuff, some sketchy stuff, some like NC-17 stuff. But he starts with, I need you to be one, one voice, and he's going to tell us, carried along by God's Spirit, what that one voice is. And there's no deviating from what that one is. But he wanted us to be one, and one is hard. One is hard. But unity, that unity, that oneness, that starts with me. And so, I don't know what God's saying to you, but what I've asked the, uh, the bands to do is they're going to uh, uh, perform a song for us, and I'd like you to stay seated. We're, you're not going to sing this. You'd be, either be in an attitude of reflection or prayer. Listen to the words, and listen to what God's saying to you about what he said from his word and what he's calling us to be as a local church, not just as a local church. Unity starts with me in unity with other churches. We are not the only Jesus-preaching, Bible-believing church in northern Michigan. Amen? Amen. That's why, by God's grace, we have student ministries that are, are, are cooperating with other churches to have a youth camp. Why our men's ministry partnered with another church to have a men's retreat. I don't get to throw stones, ever. Jesus said, whoever has no sin gets to cast the first stone. I may have slight disagreements. I choose this church. I love the tabernacle. Man, if I ever get a tattoo, it's going to be the tab logo. <laughs> Not there, right here. Be the calf guy, you know, whatever. Somebody's out there, I can't believe he'd get a tattoo. Calm, calm down. <laughs> Jesus' prayer that we'd be one. One Lord, one Savior, one God, one faith, one cross, one baptism, one resurrection, one church. Christ is the head, and it's in his name. Amen.